Okay, uh, Rafael Sancio. Apparently, he was born on April 6, 1483, and he died also on April 6, 1520. But there are two uh, alternatives. Uh, he was either born, uh, I think, on the 28th of March, or is not exactly known or the 6th of april but he did he did die on april 6 1520 so raffaello sancio da urbino um march you see born march 28th or april 6 and he died on april 6 known as raffael was an italian painter and architect of the high renaissance his work was admired for its clarity of form ease of composition and visual achievement of the neoplatonic ideal of human grandeur. Together with Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci, he forms the traditional trinity of great masters of that period. But he was the youngest in terms of lifespan. Uh, Michelangelo lived the longest and Leonardo I think died at 67 or so. And then um, Raphael died at uh, 37. Uh, th some drawings. I will go rather quickly because we have a lot of material to show. Drawings. Of course, he drew impeccably like any Renaissance master. And here we are talking about one of the greatest masters, and that is uh, Raphael. So I will make two presentations, one with uh, him as an artist, and one with uh, his architecture. Rafael Sancio, perhaps born and died on the same day, the 6th of April. So, Michelangelo Lee built works that are still with us today. Leonardo da Vinci didn't build, but he had preoccupations about architecture. There are many sketches, architectural sketches. Apparently, he did that um, uh, hel helicoidal uh, stair at, uh, in, in France at Chambord, but it's not. It's not completely sure that he did. And then Raphael did build, but uh, only a few things came down to us. We are, we are going to see them. Raphael, Raphael Sancio. This is a preparatory drawing for, for the School of Athens. Paintings, paintings of Raphael. He was truly a, a formidable painter. Uh, and uh, what can we say? One of the greatest painters of, of all times. This is the School of Athens. Apparently, this is uh, Michelangelo here. And uh, anyway, represented uh, symbolically Plat Plato and uh, Aristotle. There are others. There must be also, uh, I don't know where he is, um, Raphael himself. Anyway. These, these beautiful works are very luminous at the, in, in, at the Vatican. They are unbelievable. Ideal cities. It was uh, the Neoplatonic school uh, that uh, originated in Florence with um, uh, Ficino. And the, 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 it was this, indeed, this rebirth that, that uh, generated this. Uh, incredible uh, uh, creative energy. I wish we could have ourselves uh, something similar in a way, you know, to have uh, to have uh, this this 
thirst for knowledge and this curiosity, this uh, here is Michelangelo, uh, I mean, behind the, uh, you know, the metaphor of the, of the fresco. Here is, uh, here is uh, Raphael. This is Raphael, the painter of this uh, great uh, fresco. Here he is. Rather feminine face in a way, but from what I understood, I don't know if I remember correctly, but it seems he, he died because of his very intense romantic life. Um, you, you wonder, you know, when, when did he have time to, to, for romantic lives or life um, when he was, uh, you know, so fully, uh, you know, present in his art. But I guess uh, life and art uh, nourish each, each other uh, somehow. Now the, the nostalgia for uh, ancient Greece is a very noble one. Uh, and uh, it, because, you know, it's, it's in a way uh, a golden age of, of humanity and uh, Renaissance tried to, you know, uh, bring back the glory of that um, of that time. You know, if I look at this figure and it represents Michelangelo, uh, I see a thinking man, a man also probably with melancholia, uh, a, a, a man who didn't de reject the contemplative life. And I think this is what we need badly in our time. We, we forgo the contemplative life. Of course, everybody has moments of, uh, you know, dreaming or being absent-minded and so on. But to, to cultivate contemplation creatively and to, to, uh, to have it uh, present in our lives in uh, in the same measure that we have uh, the so-called uh, vita activa, we are very active. Yes, we we you know we run to the left and to the right, but uh, this kind of uh, contemplative life we rarely have. We have some free time, but uh, in the free time, uh, what do we do usually? We don't think about the future of the world. We don't compose poems. Uh, we don't draw. We don't sing. In general, of course, there are exceptions and the artists are such exceptions and we need the artists. So this is uh, the school of Athens that we looked at or Parnassus, you see it in the, in the context of the room. Uh, I mean, these were painted by, uh, by Raphael, the man with a very rich uh, romantic life. Uh, he died at 37, but uh, we talk about him, don't we? And we see it's huge. Uh, you see the, the door. It is huge. Hello, uh, Mr. Rafael Sancio. Um, I, I wasn't always a, a great uh, fan, so to speak, of, of Rafael because his uh, painting is so luminous and so clear that uh, didn't coincide with my interest, but I'm beginning to change. A portrait of Pope Leo the, the Tenth and two cardinals. The humanity of the of the figures is impressive, considering that you know not too long ago. In the Middle Ages, this kind of representation would have been uh, impossible. But this is what the Renaissance meant, the return of the human being, so to speak, with, uh, you know, with uh, his or her realism, with, uh, uh, you know, a belief in, uh, in uh, deciphering the mysteries of the world through uh, logic, and uh, but I, I personally uh, miss the medieval time somehow. I think uh, the conquest of the world and uh, the troubles that came with it, 
generated uh, or were amplified after the Renaissance, the triumph of, of the human being. Uh, here at this time, we still see angels in the sky, but nobody would think these days, you know, of something like this. You know, we don't believe any longer in, uh, in you know, in angels. Uh, at that time, although the human being was liberated, um, the people still were anchored in, in, the, in the not very remote traditions of the Middle Ages when there was faith and when the Gothic uh, societies um, built incredible cathedrals. But the sky in, in the paintings of Raphael are indeed very luminous. The, the blue that uh, he uses is, is, is very distinctive and very, uh, very beautiful. Raphael, Raffaello, Raphael Sanzio, many Madonnas and angels and uh, so on, but the human beings also are kind of angelic. Archangels. A different world. I mean, you know, we have cars, we have vehicles, we have uh, bombers, we have uh, satellites. We uh, who would paint something like this today? Was it a better world? I'm not sure. I'm sure they had terrible wars and troubles themselves, poisonings and so on. Lorenzo de' Medici died young and his brother, Giuliano de' Medici, even younger. You know, uh, it was a troubled time then too. We have the Ukrainian war, but uh, that time wasn't easy at all. In fact, um, Oscar Wilde, um, was bemused by, uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, he talked about Switzerland and he said, Switzerland is neutral. He didn't have wars for centuries, but what did it create? The uh, cuckoo's uh, um, clock. While uh, in Italy during the Renaissance, there were poisonings, uh, wars, um, big dramas, and they gave birth to the Renaissance. I think he was a little bit um, harsh on the Swiss and plus since his time, the Swiss uh, proved themselves and continue to prove themselves uh, admirably, at least in architecture, but in other fields as well. Um, anyway, Raphael, Picasso said that he learned to paint like Raphael in four years and to paint like a child in a lifetime. by the way of Raphael. And he did all this work until he was 37. Here he is. He was quite successful as an architect as well. He wanted to build, or he started, I don't remember very well, but um, he had a big uh, plot of land in Rome. And I think he started uh, to build a huge, a huge building for himself. But he died young, as we said, at 37.
tomorrow it will be an interesting day too because we, I will talk about uh, Leo Krier and uh, Heinrich Tesenov and uh, somehow it's a good uh, good uh, sequence from uh, Rafael and Dürer to Leo Krier and uh, Heinrich Tesenov. He painted too many paintings, <laughs> but no, I am no. What I'm trying to say is that uh, you know we we have to show a lot of things, and uh, I am I'm rushing a little bit. But you know, just just to glance at these works, perhaps it will have an effect on us. It was it was excellence. It is excellence. We are talking about one of the greatest masters of European painting and art in general. Ah, today I read that Wolf Frick said uh, that architecture is art. He said it plainly uh, because he was, uh, maybe you know, uh, Wolf Frick and Kopp Himmelblau didn't stop uh, working for Russia when the war started. He continued to, to do projects there. And he was one of the famous architects if not the only one who didn't, uh, you know, uh, stop working um, uh, for Russia. And he said, uh, architecture is an art and art has nothing to do with sanctions and so on, with frontiers between countries. I'm, I'm not so sure because, okay, he said, I do not build for Putin. I understand this, but in what way is he protesting war? This is the issue. While uh, Norman Foster and uh, MVRDV and Zaha Hadid architects and others, they left, they left Russia. That was their way of protesting, but Wolf Prix uh, doesn't seem to be interested in uh, protesting because he believes art has nothing to do with sanctions and so on, but uh, I don't think matters are so simple. Anyway, um, but what is interesting that an, uh, an important architect today, who is Dr. Honoris Kaurza at uh, UAUEM in Bucharest, said that uh, architecture is art, is an art, when uh, not too many people, at least here, believe this. would say that the relationship between a building and architecture is through art, that a building becomes architecture through art. But it's true, there are differences between architecture and art. So I wouldn't put it so bluntly, architecture is art. It could become art when it transcends being a mere building, but it's, it's, a, it's a complex uh, process. Look at this painting. It's, it's, it's magnificent. I mean, it's better than it's better than any. No, I shouldn't say so. There are also great uh, photographs, but um, it, it is perfect. When did he paint all these paintings? You know, besides being an architect and besides being in love so many times as I read, he was. Uh, by the way of love, uh, I, I, and I also, by the way of Oscar Wilde, what Oscar Wilde said, one should always be in love. That is, one should never get married. So kind of, I mean, you know, humorous sarcasm. But there are other people I read who think that um, uh, marriage kills love. Not always, fortunately, but sometimes it does because you become accustomed to the person you are with and that mystery, that drama of the love story kind of diminishes. I used to know who these people are, but uh, I forgot. 
Anyway, Raphael, you painted too many paintings, please. Soon will be Easter, so we should uh, perhaps look again at his paintings. Okay, and now we look at uh, at, uh, at him as uh, as an architect, uh, Raphael, uh, architect. Here it is. So after Bramante's death in 1514, Raphael was named architect of the, of new of the new Saint Peter's. Bramante made a proposal, but um, it didn't come through, although it came through in a way through the proposal of Michelangelo. Most of his work, Raphael's work there was altered or demolished after his death and the acceptance of Michelangelo's design, but a few drawings have survived. It appears his designs would have made the church a good deal glo gloomier than the final design with massive Peers all the way down the nave like an alley, according to a critical posthumous analysis by Antonio da Sangallo the Younger. It would perhaps have resembled the temple in the background of the expulsion of Hel Heliodorus uh, from the temple. Uh, here you see on the left is the Saint Peter as Bramante envisioned it. Then this is Raphael's scheme. You see the long uh, alley, as it was called. And this is uh, Michelangelo, but with the addition of Carlo Maderna. Michelangelo's uh, scheme was very similar to Bramante, in a way. He didn't, uh, th this is the, the contribution of Carlo Maderno, uh, who added uh, this part of St. Peter. So again, this is the scheme the plan that Raphael proposed. Raphael's plan was for a basilica in the form of a Roman cross with a short pronouns and facade. So this is by Raphael, the plan that Raphael proposed. Um, it seems he forgot to, to draw these columns here symmetrically. Uh, anyway, I don't know if this is, exactly what he, he drew. So this is the plan as, as it was not realized. Uh, Raphael's plan was for a basilica in the form of, of a Roman cross with a short pronounced and facade. I already read this. Uh, here is an interesting uh, painting uh, showing, this is Raphael <clears throat> showing uh, his plan <clears throat> to, the <clears throat> to the Pope <clears throat> and uh, Apparently, this is this was supposed to be Michelangelo, uh, who came afterwards uh, and uh, you know realized the the, the plan of 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 San, San Pietro, uh, kind of similar to what Bramante proposed. But uh, here he is, the architect, the young uh, Raphael, uh, showing uh, you know uh, the plan. Uh, I don't know who this person is, though, because this is uh, Raphael's plan. Could this be Bramante? It's possible because uh, he was older uh, than both Michelangelo and Raphael. Anyway, this is the plan of, of Michelangelo. And we know this kind of scenes you now where any architect who goes to talk with a client or the beneficiary has renderings and the palpitations and the head is in the hand and not on the head and so on. Anyway, we could assume that life didn't really change so much in its essentials. And uh, you look at the expression of the Pope, you know, the typical uh, beneficiary's uh, face rather stern and scrutinizing the plan with a rather rather critical critical uh, eye altar of transfiguration with a painting by raphael from 1520 he died in 1520 on the 6th of april that is exactly 502 years ago here it is magnificent 
with the tourists staring at it, tourists coming from all over the world. Stanze Vaticane, the liberation of St. Peter, Raphael. Here the painting is integrated with architecture. Uh, and uh, so it's, 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 it's not an easel painting, painting, it's a fresco that is integrated, uh, is part and parcel of the building, of the walls. Uh, it would have helped if I knew the narratives, the biblical narratives that, uh, you know, uh, he illustrated. He designed several other buildings and for a short time was the most important architect in Rome. Can you believe it? So Raphael, for a short time, was the most important architect in Rome. And there were some other great architects during his time, but he was considered the best, working for a small circle around the papacy. The Pope Julius had made changes to the street plan of Rome, creating several new uh, thoroughfares, and he wanted them filled with splendid palaces. An important building, the Palazzo Branconio dell'Aquila for Leo's papal chamberlain Giovanni Battista Branconio was completely destroyed to make way for Bernini's piazza for St. Peter's. But drawings of the facade and courtyard remain. The facade was an unusually rich decorated one for the period, including both painting, painted panels on the top story of three and much sculpture on the middle one. Palazzo Branconio della Guila. Uh, here is a um, you know, uh, drawing of it. And indeed, we see the, the ornamentation in, you know, in the middle, uh, in the middle uh, of the building, the second floor. Maybe this is, uh, no, this is, cannot be a drawing by him. The main designs for the Villa Farnesina were not by Raphael, but he did design and decorate with mosaics the Chigi, Chigi Chapel for the same patron, patron Agostino Chigi, the Papa, papal treasurer. Another building for Pope Leo's doctor, the Palazzo, Palazzo Jacopo da Brescia, was moved in the 1930s, but survives. This was designed to complement the palace on the same street by Bramante, where Raphael himself lived for a time. So we look at the Chigi Chapel. The Chigi Chapel or Chapel of the Madonna of Loreto is the second chapel on the left-handed side of the nave in the Basilica of Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome. It is the only <clears throat> religious building, <coughs> I'm sorry, it is the only religious building of Raphael which has been preserved in its near original form. So we are talking about the Chigi Chapel. The chapel is a treasure trove of Italian Renaissance and Baroque art and is ranked among the most important monuments in the Basilica. This is the plan of the chapel. And here it is. And the painting is by him as well and he did the architecture and he did the fresco. I don't know if he did this drawing as well. So it's this Chigi Chapel that he built inside this, uh, this uh, Basilica, Basilica of Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome. So this came down to us from Raphael's time and not too many things architecturally came down to us. The dome with the mosaics of Raphael of, in the chapel, uh, quite impressive, built impeccably and uh, art, of course, uh, sings together with the building, with the architecture, the same song. God the Father studied by Raphael for the dome, a beautiful drawing, The personification of winter, also by uh, Raphael, Raphael Sanzio. Salviati, Chigi, separation.
Salviati, Chigi, Sun, Moon. It's all based on the Bible. Um, if you are a good reader of the Bible, you understand better these, uh, these frescoes. Salviati, Chigi, Earth. Obviously, it's about art and it's about beauty. I envy actually that time. I mean, I'm sure it was a difficult time, but uh, an architect still had artistic interests and, uh, you know, painted most often and sculpted and uh, a different kind of uh, different kind of architects. Probably they didn't um, uh, didn't even cross their minds to uh, you know participate in auctions for uh, detailed. German magazine Palazzo Jacopo da Brescia, also by uh, uh, by Raphael, and uh, I think this was re removed was was moved somewhere else or it was demolished, but it came down to in, uh, in, it came down to 1930 or so. Uh, I don't know if it still exists. It looks better in the photograph than in the drawings, you know. Yeah, I think it was removed to make room for that uh, piazza that uh, Bernini built in front of San Pietro, in front of the entrance in San Pietro, the facade of San Pietro being done by Carlo Maderno. Here it is. I like this building very much. I, 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 I regret uh, it is not there any longer. It's, um, it's impressive as it is in this, in this photograph. Architect Rafael Sancio. I don't know, it was moved here or it was um, transformed and kept in the same place. I, I have to double check. Uh, the Villa Madama, a lavish hillside retreat for Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, later Pope Clement VII, was never finished and his full plans had have to be reconstructed speculatively. He produced a design from which the final construction plans were completed by Antonio da Sangallo the Younger. Even incomplete, it was the most sophisticated villa design yet seen in Italy and greatly influenced the later development of the genre. It appears to be the only modern building in Rome of which Palladio made a measured drawing. Not a little thing. Villa Madama, Rome, Raphael and Antonio da Sangallo, 1525. I guess Sangalo started to work on it because Raphael died in 1520. I don't know exactly what he did here, but uh, he worked uh, on, on this uh, important villa. And uh, there were other architects, I think, besides um, Da Sangalo and Raphael. Logia of Raphael. Now we know the answer to the question, what did he do here? He did this Logia. I don't know if he did also the, the ornamentation, the decoration, maybe just the architecture, but I think he, he worked both on the, on the, on the, on the building and on, on the artwork that was part of the building. Villa Madama. It's a hybrid building. Is I never quite understood what's going on here, and uh, you know what exactly did who. But it's it's a famous uh, it's a famous villa coming down to us from the Renaissance. It has all kinds of parts. That's why it's a little bit uh, confusing for me. Sante Eligio degli Orefici, Oref, Orefici, initially designed by Raphael for the Guild of Goldsmiths. When they split off from the Guild of Iron Workers in 1509 and dedicated to their patron Saint Eligius. It was completed by Baltasare Peruzzi and Bastiano da Sangallo. Besides his work, 
on St. Peter's Basilica. This is the only church in Rome that although partially can definitely be attributed to Raphael. Its cupola is attributed to Baltazar Peruzzi, and I made a presentation on him. And the interior is also by Raphael in a Bramante-like style, though the present facade is early 17th century and by Flaminio Poncio. And it's, uh, you know, uh, difficult to read. I mean, to, to, to uh, you know, to, to read on the street, but here is the building in the corner. And it's, I, I like it, it's interesting, you know, it's, um, impure, so to speak. It's not majestic. It's a little church, a little jewel, no, where Raphael worked. And we see the interior, and we see the entrance door. Um, what can we say? Rome is full of such jewels, yeah, even in very unexpected places. Roma, Sant'Eligio degli Orefici. Is that drawing by him? Maybe. The ar our architecture is very, you know, simple and almost austere. Maybe, you know, there was no time to, to create a, the, the painterly coverings. It's possible. And he was also a builder, clearly. And he knew how to build. He was. We read he was the most important architect in Rome for a short time, but he was. Chiesa di Sant'Eligio degli Orefici, Orefici. The plan is uh, very you know, simple and it's a small building, but only some floor plans remain for a large palace planned for himself on the new Via Giulia in the Rione of Regola. Rigola, for which he was accumulating the land in his last years. It was on an irregular island block near the river Tiber. Tiber. It seems all facades were to have a giant order of pilasters rising at least two stories to the full height of the Piano Nobile, a grandiloquent feature unprecedented in private palace design. So he was not the most modest man in the world. Raphael asked Marco Fabio Calvo to translate Vitruvius' four books of architecture into Italian. So he had scholar, scholarly interests as well. This he received around the end of August 1514. Uh, he died six years later, so he was 31 years old. It is preserved at the library in Munich with handwritten margin notes by Raphael. Isn't it beautiful? So this painter asked that person to translate Vitruvius, the four books on architecture, and he read them, you know, uh, thoroughly. And there are handwritten margin notes by him on the book. Palazzo Pandolfini in Florence, another work by him. Uh, I was in Florence a few times. I didn't know of this building. Maybe I passed by it, but maybe not. Anyway, jewels, Italian jewels in Florence, in uh, Siena, in Rome, in everywhere. Palazzo Uguccioni in Florence with a question mark. Is it by him the palace was built for Giovanni Uguccioni starting from 1550? He died in 1520. Its design has been variously attributed to Raffaele, Michelangelo, Andrea Palladio, Bartolomeo Amanati, or Raffaello da Montelupo. Although no proof exists, if not that its drawing came from Rome in 1549 and that its style was reminiscent of Raffaele's or Bramantes, which were a novelty in Florence at the time. It is the only building in Florence with columns on its facade. Did he work on it, on the plans? It's not established, but it's interesting to know this. This is the only building with columns on its facade in the whole of Florence. Okay, and now if you 
want will go quickly to because it's still uh, it's still uh, important i think to to pay homage to this other formidable artist uh albrecht durer i'll go very quickly because it's rather late and i apologize because it's because of me that that we arrived at this time here but uh, i hope you will not regret so a house for albrecht durer so he died albrecht durer died in 1528 so eight years after Raphael died, uh, I think he was 54 or 56 years old. He lived a little bit longer than Raphael and died in 1528 on the same day, April 6. Uh, truly a great, great, great uh, German and universal artist. Here he was with this magnificent, um, magnificent self-portrait uh, apparently, his father was born uh, very, very, very close to the frontier with Romania. Uh, some even think that, uh, you know, he, he came from, uh, uh, there is even a, an engraving uh, done by his son, meaning by Albrecht Dürer, uh, with, a, with a, a gate. It was, I think, a, some kind of a graphic work uh, depicting his father uh, and there is a, a, a gate there that seems to be from Maramures in the engraving by uh, uh, well based on the drawing by Albrecht Dürer he was truly I would say the equal of Raphael but from the you know German world from the Saxon world um, I, I love Dürer he also had you know, uh, various interests, even scientific interests. And uh, I know he did studies for um, ideal cities. Um, I, I admire Albrecht Dürer because although he was, he lived during the Renaissance in Italy, in Germany, Renaissance arrived later. So in a way, uh, Albrecht Dürer lived in between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And this I try to convey in my short invitational text, uh, commemorative as it was for uh, the competition, A House for Albrecht Dürer, which I launched in 2002, so 20 years ago in Sibiu. And I allow me to read it, Albrecht Dürer, you see he was born in 1471 and died in uh, 1528. So he died at uh, either 56 or 57 lived at a time when the medieval spirit was still alive, at least in that part of the world where he lived, where the Renaissance was already established. Perhaps we cannot justify everything historically, but one certitude we do have. Dürer, Dürer had a polar personality, being equally attracted towards the rational suggestions coming from the Renaissance and the so-called shadows of the Gothic. In certain ways, perhaps, we live now, I wrote this in 2002, we live now in a period of time that we might describe as transitional. The lights of the Enlightenment are less bright, to say the least, while the seductions of the darker side of life seem to animate us again. This is not to suggest that a new medieval spirit might just be around the corner, but perhaps several aspects of life, spiritual and practical alike, neglected by modernity might be appealing again. We initiate the following. We intend to organize an exhibition and possibly publish a book with the title, A House for Durer. Everyone is welcome. We expect to receive proposals that inspired by the very essence of Durer's work, to initiate a dialogue between our time and his, and even more to offer suggestions for a possible future enlightened enough yet still mysterious. This event is organized by the Romanian Order of Architects, the Sibiu Hermannstadt branch, and the opening exhibition will take place in this medieval town from Transylvania. But we expect to make it a traveling exhibition through Europe, throughout Europe, and maybe beyond without avoiding, of course, Nuremberg, the birthplace of the great German artist. There are no restrictions of any kind regarding either the format 
or the content of the proposals. The only requirement is that this house would be done in such a manner that the present day Durer might have been quite happy to dwell in. But even in the absence of such a prospect, the attempt to unite art and science, reason and feeling, light and shadow is a noble one and, and highly necessary. And here you see a picture of Sibiu at that time in 2002, you see uh, November 29th, 2002, a uh, banner, a large banner was floating between the two sides of the um, uh, street, uh, Nicolae Balcescu, a house for Dürer. This was a, an assertion of art and ideas and cooperation, and it was beautiful as such. Uh, um, so, Alexandra Schmidt, Ulrich Thomas Kirchner, USA, a project for a house for Albrecht Dürer, who died as we know, uh, now almost uh, 500 years ago, in, in uh, 2028, there will be 500 years since he died. And here you have two young, perhaps young, I don't know, American architects designing a house for Albrecht Dürer. This is the power of art, to transcend limits both in space and time. I'll go quickly because it is rather late. And uh, I, if you want to, if you are curious to study some works, you can find them on the website, ecarch.us. A project from Christian Borkan is actually now a, a doctoral student in Bucharest. And at, uh, at the U, uh, U, uh, University of Architecture and Urbanism, Ion Minku and uh, he is an assistant there too as a doctoral student. So they did this project. Liquid, liquid in 2002, not too many people talked about liquidity at that time, but Christian Borkan and Alex Axinte uh, did, and bravo to them. Uh, you see, when you have a, a theme for a competition that is uh, open and not restrictive, all kinds of interesting things come into being. Now, Atsuhito Kitora, Japan. Yes, and they send the work not digitally because in 2002, this was not easily possible. They sent, this was sent, uh, you know, glued to a background, to a, to a panel. And all works were sent like this. It was magnificent. This was the first competition I launched. And it was just unbelievable because we didn't believe we would receive any works. Nobody knew where CB was, but we launched it. And in one month, we received uh, more than 30 projects from many countries, Japan included. Uh, here it is, a house for Dürer. Someone in Japan was interested in designing a house for Dürer and this is her project. Uh, Anyway, uh, Beckett, USA. This was a beautiful watercolor. Uh, he was actually a poet from uh, the United States. And on the back of this um, original uh, watercolor he sent, uh, it was, uh, uh, um, uh, how to say, uh, uh, meditation on the fact that between Dürer and Durere, in Romanian is a very short distance. And uh, he, he wrote, uh, I have somewhere, but I don't know where, I don't know if I show here. The, yes, I do. And it moves, you, it moves me at this moment, just as it moved me 20 years ago. So, Sir Kidir from Rainer Maria Rilke, the great uh, poet, what, what last, what, what, in Romanian, Sir Kidir, what survives in the English? What survives? Who says that all must vanish? Who knows? Perhaps the flight of the bird uh, you wound remains, and perhaps uh, flowers survive caresses in us, in the ground. It isn't the uh, gesture that lasts, but it dresses you again in gold armor from breast to knees and the battle was a pure, uh, was as pure and as angel, uh, as, uh, as uh, was so pure an angel 
uh, wears it after you. Sorry, I didn't read it very gracefully, but it does move me that a human hand, just like mine or yours, wrote this short uh, text uh, or poem by Rainer Maria Rilke on the back of his watercolor and sent it to Sibiu, a city he never heard of before. And again, this is about Dürer, is about art, is about the beauty of, 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 of breaking frontiers both in space and time, because we are in 2022, but we talk about an artist who died in 1520, but he didn't die. And this unknown to me, this person made this beautiful gesture of sending this uh, artwork uh, to Sibiu. Uh, from Turkey, even from Turkey, yes, a house for Dürer in Istanbul. He just sent this uh, panel, but someone was moved and made this work and sent it to Sibiu. Uh, Bartosz Harduk, this is a nice work, Harduk, uh, Poland. A house for Dürer competition, here it is. And I wonder why is it that we don't do such projects in the schools of architecture here and now, why? because with such projects, we stir up the imagination and the soul of the students. I'm convinced of it. Anyway, I'm not going to read this text, but uh, if you are interested, you find them on the web. Uh, they're interesting works and done seriously. This is uh, an engraving by uh, Dürer, who was uh, very interested in, in the perspectives laws. Um, Dürer's house is about perspectival space, regenerating and reworking the process of perspective drawing as seen in Dürer's illustrations in the, uh, is the premise for his experimentation in making space. Anyway, uh, Dürer's house has no place since the idea of place is somehow dislocated in postmodern ideology. Therefore, the house is located in various urban concentrations uh, where Dürer might return places of his memory, the spaces of his construction house, the Dürer's creative work, all in different levels of the house. Yet there are spaces to think and contemplate. Didn't I mention contemplation before? I did. Spaces to do nothing, voids in the house. It's memory of Dürer that is important and the imagination a scientific view of the world which enables this project to take form. It is a house for Dürer's legacy as artist and scientist, which is still alive and his construction and this construction contains. Anyway, um, from Poland. Such works stir up the imagination. And this is, extremely important to do again in the schools of architecture. If this is not done in the schools of architecture, where? Christian Risk and Julie Odic, they were at that time in uh, Tokyo. They were the studying for PhD in Tokyo. We became friends. Uh, they returned in the meantime to France and they are famous uh, photographers and architects there. He was from uh, Colombia and she was French, Julie Odic. They sent this, the solid state. They, they, they sent the work, uh, you know, done on, on Japanese mulberry paper. This I remember. I'm not reading uh, what, what they wrote here anyway. I was not very, very seduced by the work, but uh, I, I, we had a very good relationship. Carla and John Dewey, USA, a nice work, House for Dürer again. You know, again, this is the kind of works I would encourage in the schools of architecture. Because if you do such a work, you certainly will not let it, uh, you know, uh, disappear on a corridor, uh, certainly not to the garbage, because it, it represents you with your personality, with your dreaming, with your imagination. And if you express yourself in such a work, it's impossible that you will be indifferent about its destiny. Uh, 
uh, light, dark, natural, artificial, rational, mystical, precision, imperfection. So the dualities that I try to mention uh, in the in the in in the invitational text, this team try to honor through the work. Again, from the United States. Now Christiane Hantelmann from Germany sent a nice work, uh, which was um, you know uh, attached to a panel. So it, it was sent physically to 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 Sibiu uh, from Germany. I forgot exactly, but this is the section of uh, through the house and various functions. Uh, I, I like this project. Uh, you know, here you see the the plan, and uh, in detail here with the three spaces, the three floors. Uh, you know just quickly an image of the work higher sphere transparency basis massive so yes the higher sphere is above you know the light column connecting the different floors sorry uh, these we photographed so they were not sent these projects were not sent digitally so we had to photograph them and the photographs uh, you know the resolution is not great uh, anyway pictures of the model claudio toma romania i think he's an important architect in romania now in timisoara if i'm not mistaken there are no shadows without light this is the project he did claudio claudio toma between darkness and light the projection of yourself in time life light interesting and well well presented So again, this competition took place in, in the year 2002, 20 years ago. Compass Group, Hungary. This was an interesting uh, three-dimensional panel that they sent from Hungary. Daniela Engelmann and Christian Selner, Germany. This uh, they imagined that the house would be actually a vehicle, will be inside a vehicle and uh, an exhibition and so on. And this vehicle would travel through through Europe and uh, maybe beyond, uh, carrying the spirit of the great Albrecht Dürer with it, within and with it. He was indeed one of the best artists uh, uh, Europe ever produced. Darren Kappel, an interesting um, British um, architect who lived in Vienna at that time and we became friends. Somehow uh, the House of Dürer explores a theme that fascinated him, the geometry and proportion of the human body. <clears throat> Dürer, like Leonardo da Vinci at all, was curious about the way the human body conforms to the proportion of phi, of P. The human body and other natural forms are determined according to the, the axioms of geometry and the divine proportion. At birth, the navel divides the child in half, and during maturation, the navel moves to the point of the P of the pi, P, P division, sorry, uh, and the body is divided in half by the re reproductive organs. Like the myth of the Egyptian divinity Osiris, the cyclic nature of this geometric dynamic is a poetic revelation, both on an individual and universal scale. In my work, I search for an architecture of order, tranquility, and timeless harmony, a synthesis and, 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 and an architectural expression of the mortal and immortal aspects of our world. I search for a language of architecture that speaks of the silence of the soul an architecture of light, space, and form, 
according to the eternal principles of proportion and order, a contemporary canvas for the timeless colors of light. Uh, you see architect Apple, Vienna, Europe. Uh, now, you know, it's just this um, rendering. Now, Erika Krüger, New Zealand. New Zealand, yes, sending a beautiful, uh, she was a, a teacher, a professor in some architecture school in New Zealand, and her drawings are truly beautiful. Erika Krüger, I truly live, like, 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 like her drawings very much. Uh, and, uh, you know, you would say that she studied at Bartlett. I would expect this kind of architectural uh, uh, drawing to come from, uh, from Bartlett. If she studied there, I do not know, but she was at that time in, in New Zealand. It moves me, you know, even now, 20 years later, that an architect from, uh, from New Zealand send this work and again not digitally where you just click a button no it was sent physically these were sent in a physical form it's all because of durer because durer was and is and will be one of the most important artists that uh, the world had I love these drawings. Now, maybe if built, no, but even built, you would expect a remarkable building. Precisely done, drawn, and yet mysterious. Erika Kruger. Now, this one is also beautiful and provocative because it happened 20 years ago. And look what this man did, Guy Dickinson uh, from Uni U U United Kingdom. A house for Durer, look at it like a tormented uh, animal, uh, an architectural tornado, quite, uh, quite impressive, the section through the building. You know, the, in 2002 to do something like this, this was visionary, that this was done uh, I mean, this kind of fluidities and tensions and drama came later, but he did them in 2002 for Dürer. A lot of talent here. India, even India sent a work to Sibiu, and if from India it is indeed. A house for, uh, for Dürer, a house for all. What a beautiful, succinct statement. A house for Dürer, a house for all. Very nice. USA, again, a uh, project done very seriously by Drayton Patriota. I became kind of friends with some of them. You know, we continue to have a dialogue. We don't do any longer, and I regret. But at that time was very beautiful, and it was because of the dialogue that and the cooperation and crossing the borders that true art is supposed to achieve, and it does achieve when it is honest and good and inspired. A house for Dura, a voyage of exploration and discovery through time. These were serious works, as you can see, a team of architects did this work. This is not a sketch, you know, it's a very serious work. Anyway, I'm not reading this, but you, you can see that there was a work here to do something like this. From the United States. Kirk Irwin sent some sketches from Chicago, uh, hand drawn. You see the, the variety of, of uh, modes of expression is, is, is uh, I would say, remarkable it, 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 because, it, it, you know, each one chose the, the you know, the, the mode of representation that he or she wanted. There were, there were no restrictions. That's why this variety of of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, 
approaches. They're interesting to study and to reflect on them. Now I just have a quick, uh, you know, uh, Laura Slavic and Lilian Kapatari, uh, Slavic, uh, Romania. I don't know. I don't know what these architects do now. I would be curious. I, I, I should contact them somehow or search for them. Interesting works. I guess uh, because we had a good number of Romanians, they participated because uh, actually uh, an architect wrote to me, said, you know, it's, um, it's a surprise, a big surprise that the order of architects in Sibiu organizes such a, you know, a metaphysical competition. But the imagination of the, of the architects and the seriousness shows that the, there was a lot of interest that, uh, you know, and there were no prices. LBC architecture at that time was an, uh, an interesting emerging uh, architecture office in New York City. And they did a very nice work. I didn't look at it in a long time, but uh, I still uh, I, I am emotional because I remember 20 years ago uh, looking at these works, which came from the United States physically through the postal office with, uh, you know, Vamal uh, taxis and, uh, you know, a long journey and so on. But they were sent. They were sent to, to Sibiu. Anyway, uh, I'm rushing. Oh, soon we'll end. Uh, Leopoldo Rosati and Irene, Irene del Monaco, USA, Italy. Uh, they sent works for two competitions that I launched. A nice man, Leopoldo. A house for Dürer, a house for art, a house for all of us, as that team from. Um, India said, Liano Chian Kelly, Argentina, 2002. Someone wrote, Architectura e despre visare. And this is what I see here. Of course, it's not just about this, but without this, the soul of architecture vanishes. USA. They received, I think, the first prize. Joaquin Bonifazga, uh, they're both from the United States, but Joaquin was from uh, uh, Salvador. Uh, and he um, then he studied for his master at Harvard. Good architects, both. And um, I forgot exactly when they divided the prism, a box in, in two parts, and there was the tension between the two. And the whole competition, it was actually about dualities. But they presented it very nicely. And, um, you know, it showed the digital skill. Uh, I wasn't very sure about the colors, but uh, an interesting idea to, 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 to break the box in two parts and, uh, and create that, that tension between the two parts. The Dürer's Folly, an investigation of spatial and syntactic paradox. I met you, Aki, actually, in Chicago, an interesting young man. Russell Lowy, New Zealand. This is a life has not, uh, anyway. Uh, I rush because it is late. The night is almost here. It is here already. Sorry for the delay. Satoi Akimoto, Kanto, Japan. Another work from Japan, in essence, was, you know, we recognize the greed the reason behind the greed, but then we, we infuse the unpredictability of liquid. So we have two systems. And I think uh, conceptually, this is uh, very valid, how to bring the rigidity of the greed 
and allow also for the freedom, for the fluidity of, of the liquid, for liquidity to, to be present as well. It's uh, just a conceptual, uh, uh, you know, my, uh, visualization of what I was trying to uh, invite, you know, to show the duality, the Gothic and the Renaissance, and, uh, you know, Dürer in between them, and then modernism, and what would follow after modernism. And it's that injection of fluidity, of liquidity that uh, is probably, and in fact, it did follow. Uh, Davidovich, Stefan Davidovich, Italy, but he was, I think, a Romanian uh, living and working in Italy. I'm going to end very, very soon. A, a handmade drawing, but interestingly done. A house for Dürer, for me, Mr. Dürer, just a house full of light, 2002. Stephen Tark, he was uh, uh, an assistant professor in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, an excellent work, very seriously done and very, very thorough. Um, anyway, if you want to study it, you can, you can on the website that I mentioned. Stephen Tark, professor at uh, the, uh, the School of Architecture in Columbus, Ohio. Very complex work, you know. Uh, it deserves more than I can offer uh, to it uh, today. But uh, I hope I stirred up your curiosity. Joel Klein, USA, a beautiful work, very different from the previous one of Stephen Clark, a house at the edge of the sea. Uh, you know, it's it's really about the solitude of the artist, the melancholia. Uh, very well, uh, the renderings are very well done. A dream, of course, but life itself is a dream. What else is it? A house for Dürer. That's it. Thank you. And uh, we ended our uh, meeting today. Thank you for being here.